my class, chapter 13, Wolf Hollow, and today's chapter begins on page 98 of the digital text. It wasn't easy to get back to sleep that night. I'd been over the Andes farm with my father many times to trade produce for dairy, apples for cheese, beans for butter, so I couldn't help but picture it now, dark and quiet, then the constable knocking on the door, the porch light coming on, Andy's father appearing, rumpled with sleep, rousing Andy to come down for questions. I hoped Andy knew where Betty was. Maybe she had realized that all her lives were about to catch up with her and she'd run away. Or maybe she'd gone out exploring, though probably not in the rain, probably not without Andy. I couldn't imagine Toby had anything to do with it. In a way, I wished he was indeed far from here by now. But the bigger part of me hoped he'd turn up as always. He had left the camera hanging from a hook in his shack. Had he left the camera hanging from a hook in his shack, I would have believed him gone. Toby would not have taken our camera, though it was really his too. When I finally wore myself out with thinking, I dreamed about Betty, but nothing clear or memorable. Just a murky swirl that faded as soon as I woke. It wasn't morning, too dark for morning, but something more, the feel of night. Still, I could sense movement below. This time, when I went downstairs, I found that my parents were up and dressed, breakfast on the table, though it was just four o'clock in the morning, early even for farmers at this time of year. Constable Ale Aleska sat at the table eating eggs and sausage. Did you find her? I asked from the doorway, blinking in the light. Annabelle, what are you doing up? My mother said. It's still nighttime. Go on back to bed. I'm all slept out, I said. Did Betty come home, constable? No, I'm afraid not, he said. We'll start to search at first light. Her grandpa and some neighbors are already out there, but they won't find anything in the dark. The rest of us will head out soon, fresh and dry, and we'll find her if she's to be found. He didn't look fresh and dry to me. I suspected he'd been up all night. What did Andy say? Your parents and I were just getting into that, the constable said. He talked while he ate, obviously famished. Andy's a little too big for his britches, so I expected some lip. But he was shook up pretty good. He told me that he and Betty had planned to sit, skip school and spend the day together, tramping around the farms and, as he put it, having a lark. The constable shook his head. The boy was mostly calf when he talked about Betty, all the rough gone out of him, but said they were supposed to meet at the Turtle Stone first thing yesterday morning, but at the last minute his pa made him stay home to fix a fence. By the time he got to the stone, she was gone. He went looking for her, wound up at school, found out she hadn't shown up, so he went to the Glengarry's. Nobody was there. He'd figured they'd taken Betty someplace, so he went home. Did you ask him about the belfry and all that? I asked. Not now, Annabelle, my mother said. There will be time for that business when she's found. Which made some sense, I suppose. I didn't see this as separate strands. It was, to my thinking, a rope, any part of which was twined with every other part. But I held my peace. My mother warmed the constable's coffee and the three of them talked about the search while I helped myself to breakfast and listen. And then Aunt Lily appeared in the doorway. She'd taken the rollers from her hair and it fell in anemic curls around her shoulders. She was still in her robe and slippers, traces of night cream under her eyes. Did you find him? She asked. Who? We all said like a family of owls. Toby, she snapped. I'm not looking for Toby, the constable said. I thought you meant Andy. Who isn't lost and doesn't need finding, she said. She poured herself a cup of coffee and sat on the table. It's Toby you ought to be looking for before he snatches another young girl. Lily, my mother said sharply, you think Annabelle shouldn't hear such things. I agree, Sarah, but you're the one who thinks she belongs here at the table with adults. And I'd like to know, constable, has it occurred to you that the two of them are together somewhere? Betty, his prisoner. The constable sighed. 
Of course it occurred to me, Lily, he said, and I've already called the state police so they can start looking for him or them. Such talk shocked me deeply. I had never thought such a thing. I was beginning to agree with my aunt about one thing at least. I think I will go back to bed, I said. My mother gave me a sad little smile. Good girl, she said, and maybe you and the boys should stay home from school today. You're tired, and nobody will be paying much attention to their schoolwork with all this going on. Another shock. Since my mother had never suggested such a thing before, we had to be pretty sick or there had to be a blizzard raging to keep us from our lessons. I nodded. Okay. I tried to go back to sleep. I really did. But I could not stop thinking about what my Aunt Lily had said. I couldn't imagine why Toby would want to take Betty with him, make her his prisoner. She was a nasty girl and he knew it, but for some reason, Aunt Lily and even the constable thought they were together. I was sure they were wrong, and I feared that I was the only one who cared as much about helping Toby as finding Betty. My parents liked him, true enough, but a missing girl was a missing girl. Nobody else was likely to put Toby ahead of that. I lay in my bed and tried to admit that Toby had left our hills, but to have taken the camera? To have left without saying goodbye, without even some small remembrance? to let us know, to let me know that he was sorry to be leaving? I could not believe that. I was convinced that Toby had not left after all, that he was right where he was supposed to be, right where the police would be able to find him as soon as they went looking. And I asked myself, in the face of this possibility, what I was prepared to do about it. I dressed in the dark, adding layers so I could stay out long in the cold, and crept down the stairs. When I peeked into the kitchen, I found that my father and Constable Aleska were gone. My mother worked at the sink, her back to me. No sign of Aunt Lily. I crept into the mudroom, aptly named given the amount of slop we'd all tracked in over the past day, carried my boots to the door, and pulled them on from the threshold before stepping out into the wet and quietly closed the door behind me. Anyone who's ever gone from warm to bright to cold and dark knows how I felt. To my back, all safe things. Before me, a night not as black as it had appeared through the windows, but dark enough. The sky overhead clear now, no clouds to whiten the darkness, precious little starlight and no moon at all. The trees bowed to one another as if before a dance, making their own sad music and I was suddenly filled with misgivings. I had been out in the night before many times, but never alone, not past the end of our lane. Still, as I hesitated, my eyes adjusted to the night and the darkness paled some, and it would be morning soon, and I knew where I was going. Toby's shack was in Cobb Hollow, below the Glengarry Place, on the other side of our hill from Wolf Hollow, away from the schoolhouse, set in the woods not far off a dirt lane I'd walked many times. It wasn't too far, and there wasn't much between here and there except woods. I didn't like the thought of bears, but I'd seen one, only once, and it had scampered away at the sight of me. Sometimes people talked about a mountain lion in the area, but not for a long time, no more wolves around here, and I wasn't completely alone. With me out there in the dark, where men were men searching for Betty. I would have to be careful to stay out of their way. If they mistook me for her, it would deal everyone a terrible disappointment and me some trouble. So I kept to the woods, following deer trails, careful in the slick leaves. I knew my way simply by heading downhill. It was difficult to get lost in these hills since every hollow had a lane or a proper road running through it and alongside a house now and then, each one of which I knew. When I reached ground level, I took the dirt road toward Silas Cobb's old place. I didn't see his soul, but once or twice I heard people calling back and forth in the distance. The burned out foundation of the Cobb house was set back in the trees far enough and it was not visible from the road, but there was still a passable lane and a crooked wooden post sign that said, Cobb, to mark the place. 
The lane was marshy and the trees on either side bent low overhead, making a tunnel that dripped and trembled in the wind. There was no sign of a clearing where the cob house had once stood. It had been entirely swallowed up in bramble, off to one side of the lane, and the trees had grown up through the foundation. But they were thin enough that some of the sky showed above, and I could tell from the suggestion of blue in the black that the sun would be up soon. As I paused there, I heard something new. It wasn't wind, nor was it the sound of the searchers in the distance. More like an animal sound, a call of some kind, I thought. Not owl, not fox. Most ground animals and brooding birds kept quiet at night for fear of attracting the attention of predators. So whatever was making that odd noise had no such fear. I'd heard a porcupine once or twice, a blend of tooth chatter and wine mixed with a mild bleat of a bite corn with a leaky bulb. This sound was something like that, and I was suddenly frightened. I'd seen a dog once, its nose bristling with quills, and I had no intention of tangling with the porcupine. But as I stood there, the sound stopped. I listened for it, but all I heard was wind. Toby Shack was just ahead, just another bit ahead behind a stand of thick trees and ivy. He had kept the area around it clear. I could make out a stump with an axe in it, and I thought, unbidden, of King Arthur pulling Excalibur from the stone. At the door to the shack, I hesitated for only a moment, the word prisoner rising in my mind before knocking. To my astonishment, something inside moved made noise. I stepped back away from the door just as it opened, and there was Toby.